Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about our new Precision Medicine Center of Excellence and how we hope that helps solve some of the problems of schizophrenia. Uh, I show a picture here of the current CMSC building, which is, oops, this part's already torn down. This stuff is all being renovated. And we are hoping that our group, which is now located right about here in the eighth and ninth floor, will soon have new space uh, about a year and a half from now in this nice new, newly renovated wing looking over the city and the dome. So we look forward to that. Um, this is a group, uh, the Division of Neurobiology, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So learning objectives, I think, will be pretty self-evident from uh, what I speak about. And what I will talk about is the nature of heterogeneity in schizophrenia, our PMCOE, what it is and how we're defining it. And then the meat and potatoes are the various projects of the PMCOE and how each is designed to solve some of the problems uh, that we face in the research and the treatment of schizophrenia and the disorders that are similar to schizophrenia. So I'll be referring to schizophrenia and I'll generally be um, abbreviating at SCZ, but most of the comments are also going to apply to schizoaffective disorder for reasons that I'll talk about shortly. So here's the challenge. Um, schizophrenia is a heterogeneous disorder. These schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder are constructs that were developed in the late 19th and early 20th century with the goal to begin creating order out of chaos. This, of course, is the work of Kraepelin and others, including Eugen Bloiler. They recognized even then that they were just beginning the process of defining these diseases and knew that there would be much to be sorted out over time. And the problem recognized then, and still a problem, is that there's no one unifying clinical feature, no broken part, no one pathogenic pathway that defines these disorders. We are left with clinical syndromes, but clinical syndromes that are quite different. And the problem is, if um, this disorder is really many disorders, we have difficulty in making prognosis and treatment because that uh, prognosis and treatment is not individualized in any way. Individuals may be radically different and it causes trouble with research. If you group people with different disorders and ask who responds to a medicine, you are likely to lose your signal in the noise. That is a treatment that benefits one subgroup, but not others may be missed. So there's been a number of approaches to try and get at this heterogeneity and, and split up schizophrenia. One is using clinical phenotypes. So the classic phenotypes, paranoid, catatonic, hebephrenic, et cetera, have been abandoned as not being helpful at all. Um, the deficit syndrome pioneered in large part at University of Maryland are individuals with dominant negative symptoms. And the origin of schizoaffective disorder was trying to define individuals with more or less affective symptoms. So those are both subjects of ongoing, both uh, approaches that continue to be investigated. There's heterogeneity based on onset age. The famous set of studies by uh, Judy Rapport at the NIH on childhood onset schizophrenia, meaning ages 10, 11, 12, and then the recognition of late and very late onset schizophrenia. Some of uh, this work done by our own Peter Rabins. Um, again, work in progress. There's heterogeneity based on physiologic measures. One of the most well-known, one that I talk about frequently, is from the BSNP study, which identified biotypes based on electrophysiologic and cognitive studies that cut across individuals with bipolar disorder with psychosis, schizoaffective disorder, and schizophrenia, and reorganized them into more unified groups, though not perfectly. Um, imaging, of course, is being used to try and uh, resolve heterogeneity imaging of various types, and we'll come back to that as well. Heterogeneity based on etiology is also becoming increasingly uh, a matter of interest as particularly genetic studies become more and more robust. For example, the 22Q deletion syndrome commonly causes schizophrenia. There are rare point mutations that cause or at least greatly increase the risk of schizophrenia, and there are environmental factors like well, the risk factor of marijuana, and is this really something different uh, than 
uh, schizophrenia unrelated to a substance-induced disorder. So again, subject for ongoing uh, investigation. Each of these approaches has advantages and disadvantages. I wanna focus on a different one um, for the most part, one that informs our uh, Precision Medicine Center of Excellence. And this is heterogeneity based on treatment response. And this is a hypothesis that has been largely developed here at Hopkins by Fred Nusifora based on uh, a number of other external investigations and his own clinical and research experience. He's argued that patients with schizophrenia can be divided based on their treatment response. About 70% of people will respond to standard antipsychotic medicines. That doesn't necessarily mean they respond perfectly or that they respond without side effects, but they considerably improve. About 15% of individuals respond only to the medicine clozapine. Those individuals are sometimes referred to as having treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And a further 15% or so don't even respond to clozapine. These are a group of individuals grouped together as having ultra-treatment resistant schizophrenia, another 15%. So altogether, if you take the TRS and the UTRS group, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in the US alone. So it's a major clinical issue. Um, and at this point, we can't subtype between these three different groups Retro, uh, prospectively, it's only retrospectively, we don't have good a priori predictors of response. And this is important because this particular group of patients, those who are treatment resistant and ultra treatment resistant, present unique challenges for our field. These individuals are particularly burdened by their disease. They have the most severe clinical features and the worst functional outcome, and their costs are many fold higher than patients who respond to standard treatments um, for a variety of reasons, increased hospitalizations, increased need for support services and the like. Um, starting with the treatment resistant group, people who do respond to the antipsychotic clozapine, the problem is this medicine is highly underused. Perhaps only 5% of patients in the US get clozapine when the number should be at least three times higher. Why is that? Well, first of all, there's a fear of side effects by both clinicians and patients because clozapine does have a number of potentially severe side effects, cardiac, hematologic, neurological, GI, et cetera. Also, the uh, FDA has imposed requ uh, requirements on prescribing clozapine that discourages clinicians. You have to register and take tutorials and track blood work and the like. And the frequent blood draws that are required deters patients. And there's uncertainty about whether it will work in any given patient or whether it is necessary in any given patient. So the goal is to increase clozapine use by providing a priori evidence of which patients will benefit. Another issue is that most studies that have been done combine TRS and UTRS patients, those who do and don't respond to clozapine, yet these populations themselves are likely different and so an additional goal is to study each of these groups independently so uh, that uh, we can figure out what the differences are and begin tailor-making treatments. And in particular, for the people who don't respond to clozapine, there really is no alternative pharmacotherapy. Some people benefit by electroconvulsive treatment, but there are no long-standing medicines that appear to be consistently helpful. So the goal is to develop alternate treatments, and that is going to require understanding some of the pathophysiology and pathogenesis of individuals, of, of the disease in individuals with this disorder. So Johns Hopkins has developed approach to clinical heterogeneity across a variety of diseases, um, med medical diseases of various types, dermatological, and now psychiatric, it is to develop these precision medicine centers of excellence supported by a department within the Dean's office called InHealth. And I'll leave this paragraph for you. I think it um, is deserving of some hermeneutics to understand exactly what's being gotten at. But the idea is to develop um, practice of medicine using various resources to determine the differences in patients how patients may, with the same condition, respond differently, develop different complications, and how we can develop and utilize specific treatments. So that's the Hopkins goal.
The problem in psychiatry is that there are limitations. Um, so in general, I think it would be safe to say that the relevance of precision psychiatry is um, really limited to those disorders that are best conceptualized as having a disease, a broken part where we can apply ca causal logic and categorize, categorization of individuals. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and we know that precision in psych psychiatric disease has value. And a good example is contrasting dementia that's a consequence of Alzheimer's disease versus dementia from Parkinson's disease, where the treatments are different, the pathogenesis is different, the prognosis is different. Um, the limitations for precision in psychiatry, I think, uh, are exemplified by comparing it to cancer. So a tumor, imagine a solid tumor, uh, which is an independent entity. You can cut it out, you can define it by its pathology, by its molecular signature and the like. The person with the cancer is largely distinct from the disease. The experience, the narrative, the dimensional characteristics of the patient uh, have little bearing on the optimal evaluation treatment of the tumor itself. Of course, there are lots of uh, reasons that individual characteristics intrude upon the optimal evaluation and treatment, but at a theoretic level, the tumor is an entity that can be studied in and of itself. In psychiatry, in contrast, the person and their disease are much more intertwined. So I would even go so far as to argue that precision might be counterproductive in psychiatry outside of the disease realm. For example, problematic one-size-fit-all psychological theories, which our field has been prone to over time. So here's the current PMCOEs in psychiatry. There's five that I know of. Maybe there's others on, uh, on the way. Um, we are the schizoaffective disorder, uh, PMCOE. There's a psychosis one where the director is uh, Kurosawa, Huntington's disease led by Chris Ross, Alzheimer's disease by Costas Lequetzos, and mood disorders by uh, Fernando Goez. And each of these has some commonalities. We will be sharing an infrastructure, uh, particularly in data analytics, that is supported by uh, Jimmy and the Department of Psychiatry, as well as the School of Medicine. So our, schizo our PMCOE is called the schizoaffective disorder. So why aren't we the schizophrenia PMCOE? Well, there's some reasons for that. If you look at the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for schizoaffective disorder in a simplified way, people have to meet the criteria for schizophrenia, which is basically a positive, one or more positive symptoms and maybe a negative symptoms, not caused by something else, and they're long enough so that you know what you're seeing. And you add to that symptoms that may meet the criteria for a major mood episode are present for most of the total duration of both the active and residual portions of the illness. This leads us to problems at two levels when trying to divide schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. One is that the DSM concept of the two distinct disorders is likely an error, so that there's a lack of validity. That is, there's probably a spectrum of disorders that are characterized by hallucinations, delusions, and thought disorders that runs from schizophrenia to bipolar disorder, though there may be subtypes within the spectrum, so it's not a clean, simple spectrum. And the other problem is that the DSM criteria for schizoaffective disorder are difficult to establish and are infrequently applied with any rigor so that there's poor reliability. So our idiosyncratic use of schizoaffective disorder in our Precision Medicine Center of Excellence. It's designed to cover the spectrum of schizophrenia that has varying levels of mood symptoms. Though I'm going to use the terms schizophrenia and schizoaffective somewhat interchangeably for the purposes of this talk. Um, so here's our organization. I'm gonna uh, go into this in a little more detail. Um, I'm the director, Fred Nusifor is the co-director. Our, our scientific advisors are Chris Ross and Peter Zandi. We're based in laboratory bases in the Division of Neurobiology and clinical bases at Baby CPP, but with lots of branches and, and the like. I'll talk about the project leaders later. And really what's vital is to recognize our, our funding. Uh, many of the initial studies that led to uh, the data that made our center possible were funded through the ABCD Charitable Trust, uh, led by Patrice uh, de Camaray, and the current PMCOE is largely result of 
a fund generated by Mr. Leonard Abramson here. So to those individuals and their families, we're very grateful and we hope that we can make uh, their investment in us pay off an improved uh, diagnosis and treatment in the future. Um, the guiding hypotheses of this PMCE, which again were largely developed by Fred Nusifora, are one, that treatment response provides a powerful tool for subtyping patients. Second, and this is work from Dr. Nusifora's lab, is that protein insolubility is a pathogenic hallmark of at least a subset of patients, in a sense, another way of defining the heterogeneity and improving upon the um, heterogeneity of schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. And third, that treatment response and this protein insolubility um, in some patients will relate to other phenotypic features of the disease, the clinical, the cognitive, various circuitry abnormalities, and ultimately cellular pathogenic pathways. Here's um, one way of viewing the hypotheses underlying our PMCOE. Um, we recognize that genes and environment in some way are causing um, abnormalities, in, in particular in protein homeostasis, uh, which is the subgroup that has insoluble proteins and aggregation. This is driven in part by aging to cell dysfunction. On the one hand, that may cause treatment resistance, and it certainly leads to the circuit dysfunction and ultimately the clinical phenotype. And we're going to try and work at each stage of this um, hypothesized pathway to try and um, clarify the situation. So here's the PMCOE levels of analysis. And you'll see that this derives directly from the disease reasoning approach uh, that has been best described by Paul McHugh. Um, we have clinical syndromes, which we will be working with, abnormal circuitry, and including um, the level of uh, interconnection between brain regions, um, cell pathology and function, including this insoluble protein aggregation that occurs, as well as other cellular abnormalities, and the effect of mutations on various pathways. Um, this approach was really developed in practice by Chris Ross, who modeled this approach in Huntington's disease, a supposedly simpler disorder that's still 30 years after the mutation has escaped uh, treatment. But uh, Dr. Ross implemented this approach in the Division of Neurobiology, looking at multiple levels of the disease at the same time and using uh, different levels to reinforce each other to move towards better understanding of the disease and better treatment options. So here's our here's our PMCOE in a in a a nice flowery diagram, and I I'll talk about each of these different parts. These parts that relate to clinical, um, circuitry, lab work, and data mining all revolve around patients, mainly patients at Bayview and they relate to several uh, cell and uh, molecular biologic uh, projects and also to a mouse project. And I'll talk about how these interrelate uh, with each other. So let's begin with a cl clinical component of our PMCOE. Eight of the 11 projects directly rely on patient recruitment and assessment. So we have two recruitment strategies. One is to... Uh, look for individuals with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder with different treatment responses in our clinics, also comparison to people who don't have schizophrenia, and to look at individuals before and after starting clozapine. Um, and the clinical assessments are going to serve two purposes. One is to support all the other studies, or many of the other studies of the PMCOE, our imaging, EEG, and cell biology projects, but also to facilitate testing hypotheses about the clinical correlates of treatment response. These four folks are our uh, main research coordinators. You find most full-time, others are involved in other projects, Claire, Rachel, and Adrian, but uh, the success of the project largely depends on them, and I'm grateful for all their assistance. Um, our patient population comes from Bayview, um, here's this, if those of you have not been to the 5500 East Lombard building should go, it's 
I think of it as a palace of community psychiatry. It's spacious, it's comfortable. It uh, makes, I think, patients and clinicians feel that this is an important and serious enterprise. Uh, and this is led, of course, by Costas Lekezos, uh, Director of Psychiatry at Bayview, and Bill Nero, Director of uh, Medical Director of Community Psychiatry. Our clinics there compose of two different early psychosis clinics, um, one that we just call EPIC, one that's called RAYS EPIC, because it's grant funded based on a study called RAYS uh, that provides some additional services for people, and a large adult schizophrenia clinic with something like 200 patients, half of whom are on clozapine, most of whom are seen by Dr. Nusifora. And individuals who are largely responsible for the clinical operations include Krista Baker, who founded the schizophrenia programs at Bayview and is now director of uh, community psychiatry at Bayview, Katie Reinheimer, who is the um, director of adult services at uh, Bayview and is also now the coordinator for the schizophrenia programs, Arlene Cuerdo, who's the lead therapist for the adult programs, and Max Wilcott, who's the lead therapist for the early uh, programs. And there are other therapists who've joined in these efforts as well. We're asking them to do things like provide systematic ratings of patients, which they have been very enthusiastic and engaged in doing, which has greatly uh, um, helped the progress of our clinical research efforts. We will have tap into other potential patients resources, uh, both at Hopkins and potentially even at the University of Maryland. And we will be data mining the entire Johns Hopkins Medicine electronic medical record system. So our protocol is not too surprising. Uh, medical and psychiatric history, a formal psychiatric evaluation, a variety of symptom rating scales, cognitive assessments, both um, for standard cognition and also for various kinds of affective uh, cognition and social cognition. Olfaction, based on evidence from uh, Dr. Kemeth that uh, olfaction is abnormal in schizophrenia. Some kind of interesting measures of functional capacity, both standard rating scales, but also some kind of um, advanced computer-based functional assessments um, that um, Dr. Nusifora has worked on with um, Phil Harvey at the University of Miami. And we'll be obtaining biologic specimens to make fibroblast cell lines from skin biopsies, white cells to make induced pluripotent stem cells, and plasma for isolation of extracellular vesicles. More about each of these a little bit later. So here's some of the clinical questions that we hope to address. What clinical features distinguish those who do not respond to any medicines from other patients with schizophrenia? The hypotheses developed uh, in preliminary data for Dr. Nusifora are that they're more baseline cognitive and negative symptoms and worse function in these individuals. And this is a study that uh, he published comparing in blue uh, individuals uh, who do respond to clozapine to individuals in red who do not. And on all different measures of function, individuals who don't respond to clozapine do worse, and they also do worse on various cognitive measures, um, suggesting that this is potentially a unique phenotype, though there's much to be teased apart here, uh, and this is, is only the beginning of the investigations. Um, we will be mining the uh, electronic medical record for clinical insight. This is work led by Peter Zandi and my care team that's supported by Dr. Potash and the Department of the Psychiatry, supported by our statistician, Dr. Yenikayan, and managed by Jason Straub. Um, and this is where Hopkins InHealth uh, program has developed something they called PMAP, a system to integrate data from various sources that was developed at the Applied Physics Lab, meaning that they do things there other than make bombs. Um, and hopefully this will be of value to us. And we hope to ask some questions like, what are the diagnostic practices for people with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder? Do the di are the diagnoses stable? Are they used willy-nilly? What are the demographics of clozapine use? Does clozapine use affect neutrophils? Because this is what is the basis for the FDA regulations on clozapine. And maybe it's exaggerated and the regulations can be lightened and allow uh, increased use of clozapine. And I just did a little 
quick little data mining just to see what could come up with using just slicer dicer um, in Epic. And what I found is in the past year, if you look at the people, total people who have the diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, something like about 9% of everybody is on, has at least been prescribed clozapine, though much less in a very older population. So it suggests that the rate of use might be 50% less than expected if clozapine was used according to guidelines. So even within our system, clozapine is probably underused, though this is the kind of question that we can investigate in much more detail when we have um, more access to uh, the electronic medical record over time. I wanna switch now from clinical syndromes to abnormal circuitry. Um, this is going to be based in part on imaging of our clinically assessed participants using ultra high field MRI. And uh, our focus, as you'll see, on thalamocortical circuitry. And we will also be uh, looking at electrophysiologic measures to focus on cortical reactivity. Um, so the thalamocortical connectivity abnormalities in uh, schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder um, has been explored preliminarily using ultra high field MRI 7T, um, 7 Tesla. Most uh, clinical imaging is at 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla. This provides uh, enhanced resolution and at times faster speeds. Um, much of this work has been led by Jun Hua, who one, runs a laboratory based at Kennedy Krieger, also in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, he's found um, that there is increased thalamosensory motor cortex connectivity, decreased Thalamo prefrontal cortex connectivity, that's pictured, the uh, blue is low, the red is, is high in his overall scans, um, and that both worsen with disease duration. That's a really interesting preliminary finding, um, and you can see that here. Um, this is the connectivity between the thalamus and the sensor motor cortex um, that starts out abnormal but gets more abnormal over time, whereas the prefrontal thalamic cortex uh, connectivity starts out low and gets worse with time, um, suggesting, well, I, it's cross-sectional, so it gets worse in older patients. Um, and the presumption is that it is worsening over time, but that remains to be determined experimentally. But the other thing that Dr. Wah demonstrated in these studies is that you can get substantially significant results with far fewer subjects when you use 7T imaging than in typical imaging paradigms. And this greatly increases the power of what we can accomplish. So he has some questions that uh, he would like to address. Um, one is, can we confirm this relationship of connectivity versus age in, in a larger cohort of patients? Does this connectivity correlate with treatment response? Does it improve in patients who respond to clozapine, best done in a uh, longitudinal before and after study? And what other brain regions um, can uh, we show have altered connectivity in relationship to our different groups of treatment uh, response? But there's challenges to this kind of imaging. One is that the thalamus is not really a single entity. There are different thalamic regions that project to different regions of the cortex. And so I, in color, are the different thalamic subnuclei like the pulgonara and the medio dorsal nucleus, and then the brain regions which they project to. And so, if you start lumping the thalamus together as one entity, again, you'll have problems with single to, signal to noise ratio. So, this can be at least partially solved by the increased resolution of seven Tesla imaging. And Dr. Wah and others are developing strategy to try and isolate individual thalamic nuclei. Uh, in turn, when doing functional MRI, which is possible with 7T. There's a second challenge, and that's on the other side of the connection, and that's the complexity of the cortex. So averaging an fMRI signal across all the layers of the cortex fails to distinguish among different circuits, some of which are going on opposite directions. So here's an example. This is a cortical layer, um, representative, not specific, um, where 
if you look at layer four, it is receiving the projections from the thalamus and layer five is sending, and, and layer six, the lower layers are sending projections back to the thalamus. Um, and same thing, so this is a first order um, cortical uh, relay. These are the uh, higher order thalamic relays, similar issues where at the very highest levels, uh, layers one, two, three, closest to the peel surface of the brain, there's the, it's more cortical to cortical activity, and other layers respond to the to the thalamus in, in differently. If you average it all together, you increase your noise and lose signal. So how is this going to be solved? How can we look at the cortex by layers rather than averaging it all together? Well, we have two advantages. One is that seven Tesla allows uh, high resolution up to 0 0.5 millimeter voxels, this, the area uh, of resolution. And in the human cortex, the thickness is something like two to four millimeters. So it's possible to begin to sub-segment the cortex, not necessarily by individual layers, but potentially by upper and lower or upper and middle versus lower layers and the like. But then there's a conceptual problem because the cortex is twisted and curved. It varies in thickness uh, and it can even vary in thickness in the same region between um, uh, gyri and sulci, whether it's up or down in the cortex. So what Tilak Ratnanathar has done is to devise a method of mathematically flattening the cortex, assigning a vector essentially that can be used to approximate the location of each cortical layer at, even, at any given point of the cortex. And uh, about a month or two ago, he sent me this equation and said, this is the next E equals MC squared, um, and told me it solved the problem that's been festering in um, mathematical topologies uh, applied to uh, brain uh, convolution since the 1930s. This work is now being implemented on our data set by his graduate student, Milan Dower. Um, what they've done is to take the cortex, and this is from a large data set where layers three and four were basically assigned, um, and to apply their mathematical deconvolution methods to assign a, 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 essentially a vector at every little point along the cortex. Oops. Um, and um, so that regardless of whether it's in this area of cortex, which is thicker, or this part that's thinner, you can mathematically know the depth of each cortical layer and so assign your fMRI voxels to at least a subset of layers to try and minimize some of the signal to noise problems that are manifest by having um, pathways going in different directions in different cortical layers. Um, I should mention briefly that uh, Junhua is also doing a set of vascular imaging uh, methods uh, that also seem to suggest uh, major problems in schizophrenia. Um, he's developed a method called IVASO, which measures cerebral blood volume in arterioles, which are the key um, plastic change, uh, source of change in blood volume in the brain. Um, and he is uh, again, used seven Tesla imaging to look at schizophrenia and found generally a profound deficit in cerebral vasculature, uh, uh, cerebral um, uh, volume, arteriolar volume, blood arterial volume, volume in schizophrenia, except in a few focal regions that are the other direction, which is opposite to the effect seen in Huntington's disease. And this deficit appears to increase in age in multiple brain regions. That's these graphs over here. Here's blood volume. Here's disease duration for, again, cross-sectionally rather than longitudinally in any one individual. But the same general idea of uh, decreasing um, blood volume. Um, and he now will be investigating this in larger patient groups, correlating with fMRI findings and correlating it with treatment response. One might easily imagine that if your uh, arterioles are not responding well uh, to demand for blood so that your blood volume is lower than it should be, 
that one might be more impaired and less responsive to treatment, though that remains to be determined empirically. What's really interesting is this just is totally opposite to what's seen in early Huntington's disease. A nice example of uh, embedding uh, some of this work uh, within our division of neurobiology because it allows us to compare Huntington's to schizophrenia and uh, making a good point that we're unlikely to be seeing artifacts because these diseases are very different. All right, the other way we want to probe circuitry is using electrophysiology, um, using electroencephalograms, EEGs. The rationale is that response to auditory signals are abnormal overall in people with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. So if you uh, um, have people listen to a set of repetitive stimuli, um, beep, 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 they will, uh, people with schizophrenia will respond differently. And they'll also respond very differently to random deviant sounds like beep, 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 boop, beep, beep, beep. Um, there will be less of a response. Um, this kind of analysis has been used in the BSNP consortium to generate the biotypes I mentioned previously, uh, with some individuals grouping together as having a very hypo reactivity to stimuli and some having a hyper reactive. Uh, response to stimuli. And one of the real advantages to this kind of measures that it's high temporal resolution, you can measure it over milliseconds. This is what a response might look like um, that uh, if you hear a sound there and you record a brain wave uh, in the right region of the cortex, you get a, a, a positive signal after 50 milliseconds and a negative symptom, signal after 100 and then a positive symptom at 200, positive signal at 200. And you can compare these across patient groups and with different types of stimuli to begin to understand the kind of abnormality in circuitry that is likely um, to exist and that distinguishes different subtypes of patients. This is work that's being developed by our uh, postdoctoral fellow, Andor Bodnar, who uh, did some very successful work of this in his PhD thesis, uh, looking at uh, uh, spatial resolution in normal individuals. And he's able to generate figures that look something like this. The details aren't so important because this is really early preliminary data, but he can compare uh, individuals, um, the signal when people are listening to tones with their eyes closed, their eyes open, compare that and then compare across groups. And you can do that at different wavelengths uh, to try and capture different aspects of cortical circuitry. So this is going to be um, Dr. Bodnar's um, project over the next uh, year or so. I wanna switch levels again, and that is to the level of cell pathology um, and particularly to aggregations that have been detected in some individuals. And the questions here are, can evidence of cell pathology be detected in a subset of patients? Can we confirm some of the initial findings and um, develop new methods for looking for evidence of cell pathology? Does that pathology correlate with clinical and other phenotypes? Um, does the cell pathology provide clues about pathophysiological processes? And as uh, an extra extension of this, can extracellular vesicles detected in the plasma provide a window into brain biochemistry? So this is uh, a little snapshot of the key finding that uh, Fred Nusifor and Leslie Nusifor have reported um, that there is in postmortem brains, there is about a third of individuals um, with schizophrenia have insoluble protein that is not seen in normal controls and is not seen in another subset of individuals with schizophrenia. And they are in the process of understanding what this insoluble protein consists of and in confirming it in other uh, patient populations. So this alone came from three different brain banks with very consistent findings. Um, so this is um, really an, uh, a very new and intriguing finding in the entire field of uh, schizophrenia neuropathology. Um, one of the problems with postmortem brain 
uh, there's a number of problems with studying protein insolubility in pieces of postmortem brain. One is that often limited clinical information is available. These are brains that have been collected from individuals who have died and often um, there is no clinical history or very limited history. The quality of the tissue is problematic because proteins begin to degrade at the time of death. And it's difficult to perform a number of biochemical analyses on uh, tissue that's been frozen or fixed uh, bio, uh, with um, fixatives. Um, so the solution is to generate neurons from patient skin uh, biopsies and see if there's insoluble proteins in that subset of individuals and in, in, in a similar subset of individuals who are who we have clinical information on, and this generates live cells, which can be studied much more rigorously. So Nagat El Demerdash in the new Sephora lab has uh, shown the effectiveness of this technique. She started out with patient skin biopsies that, and the skin biopsies were then um, uh, converted into fibroblast cell lines, and this fibroblast is uh, one of the main cells in the skin. And then using a standard, um, um, well, I should say a developing method for converting skin cells into neurons or neuron-like cells, she succeeded. Tub three is a marker for neurons and you, it stains different um, cell lines that she studied. She took two people with Huntington's disease, two people with schizophrenia and two control individuals. What's really interesting is these three rows that are labeled UB. Ubiquitin is a marker uh, that can identify proteins that have aggregated. And what she demonstrated is aggregation occurring in cells from Huntington's patients, which is known to occur. This is essentially was the positive control. She was able to show these big lumps of protein in various places in these cells. But what she was also able to show is that in one person with schizophrenia, but not another, there was also protein aggregation. Um, and there was no protein aggregation in any of the control cells. So this approach has the potential when applied to a large number of individuals to one, confirm the findings from postmortem brain studies that a subset of individuals have protein that forms aggregates, meaning that there's something wrong with the homeostatic mechanisms that control how protein is uh, processed and digested. And it allows studies of these cells to determine what else may be wrong and what distinguishes cells that have these insoluble lumps of protein from other cell types. A related project has to do with studying of extracellular vesicles. This is an alternative approach to exploring pathogenic markers in patient cells. And it's based on the finding that neurons in the brain release these little vesicles that contain various components of the cell, different proteins and enzymes, also different uh, receptors, such as the glutamatergic receptors. There's different forms of vesicles, uh, each that are somewhat different. And what makes it interesting is that these vesicles cross the blood-brain barrier and can be detected in the plasma so that you can examine what's going on in brains potentially by a blood draw. And so this work is being led by um, Liz Gerber in her own lab. Um, and Dr. Gerber has been able to isolate extracellular vesicles from blood, see them on um, Electron, by electron microscopy. And she hypothesizes that components of the glutamatergic signaling pathway, which has been widely implicated as being abnormal in schizophrenia, might be detectable in these vesicles. And she also speculates that insoluble protein fragments, the kind detected in the new Sephora lab, might also be detectable. So an entirely new and very powerful approach to understanding what is going on in the brain, in this case, by looking at the blood. I want to move to the last part of our um, uh, PMCOE, looking at the effect of mutations on genes, where we're going to ask 
what effect do mutations associated with schizophrenia have on various pathways and cells? Do these disrupted pathways relate to cell pathologies or other findings from patients? Can these pathways be repaired pharmaceutically or otherwise? And can methods for studying mutations be applied cross disorders into other psychiatric PMCOEs? So some of this work is based on a really interesting study that was just published um, about a year ago using tens of thousands of patients and controls looking at specific mutations that would cause a protein not to be made. Um, they're called protein truncating mutations, and they found mutations in 10 genes that were extremely uh, robust uh, statistically and that contributed substantial risk developing schizophrenia in the three to 50 fold range. Um, compared to the typical genetic variation from GWAS studies of uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where the uh, increase in risk is something like 1.05 or so. So these mutations um, attribute enough risk that it's getting at 50 fold, it's getting to the point where it's nearly causal. Um, and these mutations were particularly detected because they cause lack of protein expression in the, from the gene uh, where the mutation occurs. And you can see there's 10 of them that they picked out. Um, so we want to explore the pathogenic implication of these mutations. This is work that's going to be led by Pan Lee, who was just awarded an R01 this month for this project. Um, she is going to use as her model system for studying mutations, human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which can be maintained, but can also be differentiated into neuronal-like cells using um, biochemical methods. She is also going to um, hedge her bets a bit by using uh, stem cells that are known to have a number of genetic variants already, small ones, that puts them in aggregate in a category that would be considered high risk or or a high genetic risk for schizophrenia. Essentially, it's choosing cells with a genetic background, then adding a mutation to it, and then looking to see what the effect of that mutation is. Um, and she's going to focus on three different cellular pathways. Um, one is involving protein homeostasis, which gets back to the insolubility issue that had been that uh, was detected in the new Sephora lab. Also, genes involved in transcriptional regulation and in synaptic transmission. Um, her approach uh, is to introduce mutations that have been discovered by the schema um, consortium directly into iPSCs using a method that she developed while studying a rare disease, for which she's also received an R1 this year to study. Um, and she has figured out a way to introduce mutations without causing any other changes in the cellular DNA. So it's a very clean kind of approach. Um, and so this study, um, we're all very excited about because uh, it has a great potential. Um, we're also going to focus on one particular one of these genes called COL1 that was associated genetically with schizophrenia but also is functionally relevant um, and um, because it may have to do with how protein solubility is controlled. I'll just go right to the picture. Col1 is this gene here. It's part of this process where a protein has ubiquitin attached to it, and that leads it to be degraded. If this Col1 gene is missing, this system will fail and proteins are likely to accumulate. So this is work that's going to be done by Hannah Jaro Pellet in the lab. She's already developed ways to knock down Col1 in cells. And she also has in her possession a knockdown mouse that uh, where Col1 can be uh, deleted. Uh, and she'll be specifically targeting deletion in the forebrain to see what the effect is of losing Col1. Does it cause um, behavior abnormalities in the mice? Does it cause protein uh, homeostasis problems uh, like we predict to occur in patients with schizophrenia? Um, 
And last, I want to briefly mention Ank gene, a gene that was linked to mood disorder um, genetically, and that encodes a protein called Ank G. It's the gene is Ank3. It encodes a protein called Ankerin G, which is involved in anchoring various channels uh, to the plasma membrane right at the point of the axon in uh, cells, uh, neurons that lead them to electrically fire. So it's in a functionally really important gene. Um, and mouse models have been generated now in the Ross lab that interestingly, if you lose NG, you have something like manic-like behavior that is normalized by lithium and valproic acid. And in the Ross lab, uh, they are developing techniques uh, that are led by uh, Kia Bashiri to um, use, uh, identify, gene expression patterns in individual cells. They discovered already preliminary evidence that losing ANC3 leads to loss of potassium channels in excitatory neurons, and it may even be reversed by lithium. Maybe this model can be used for testing new treatments, and it certainly is applicable to a number of other projects. So to wrap up, um, our schizoaffective disorder projects can be reorganized in this way to look to show how we're looking at multiple different levels. Uh, each supported by preliminary data, but each which we hope to advance the field. And so my last slide, just to, as a reminder, um, based on this world-renowned jazz musician, schizophrenia doesn't mean the end of a meaningful life, but we can certainly do better for more people. Thank you, Russ. That was, that was superb. Uh, wow, what a fascinating uh, array of, of projects and, and well thought through and well well organized. Um, well, let me ask you, you're, you're working on many levels of investigation, as you said. Did, could you say a little bit about what you think, which one of or a couple of these are most likely to lead to 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 um, to clinical impact the, uh, in the shortest time frame? Well, the shortest impact is easy. It's um, doing some of the data mining and saying, ha, people who aren't getting clozapine are most likely to have these characteristics and we can target them or target their clinicians. So that would be the fastest thing. Mm, interesting, okay, good point. Um, uh, John Lipsy makes the point that his criticism of precision psychiatry is that at the clinical level, we simply aren't there yet. At the research level, it is of course hopeful and laudable enterprise. Um, okay, I, I certainly Maybe. agree. That may not need comment, but thank you, John. Uh, Bill Narrow says, thanks for a great talk. I'm happy to see you're using your idiosyncratic definition for schizoaffective disorder. Uh, when I was working on, on DSM-5, I advocated unsuccessfully to abolish yeah. schizoaffective disorder in favor of schizophrenia with varying degrees of mood symptoms. One question, do you think there are any significant differences between patients being seen in academic centers versus non-academic community settings in terms of who's a responder and who's a um, uh, treatment resistant or ultra treatment resistant or environmental factors? Possible, though our academic center kind of looks a lot like a community center uh, at Bayview and, and uh, Johns Hopkins Community Psychiatry. But we also have access to another project uh, that a number of us are involved in, which is every uh, a consortium of every early onset uh, or first episode psychosis clinic in Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania, many of which are not associated with academic centers. And so there's some possibility of reaching out beyond our centers. Great. And Ray DePolo says, Russ, thanks uh, for these for this round. If you use clozapine response as a diagnostic instrument, what about those classic bipolar cases who respond so well to clozapine? Does this mm -hmm. reveal something useful or is it a problem for your diagnostic breakdown of types? Oh, I think it reveals something useful that there's likely to be this um, certain aspects of these disorders that are going to be biochemically similar. And uh, that's to be explored. It's why there needs to be a close tie between uh, the work being done in the schizoaffective uh, PMCOE and the mood disorder PMCOE, uh, particularly looking at um, stem cells and what are the biochemical pathways. Great. And and Costa says, great talk. Have you looked for uh, extra cellular vesicles in brain tissue from people with and without schizophrenia spectrum conditions 
uh, Maka, Rocky, and Whit Whitworth have shown in Alzheimer's that there are unique Alzheimer's signatures in EVs derived from brain tissue. These might form a basis of looking for specific EVs in blood. Ah, I think Dr. Gerber next answers this question since she's the expert in this. And the next comment down. Oh. Uh, is so so down you want to just stick with Liz's response? Uh, they haven't gone there yet. Okay. So, um, one, so last question from one row Yang. Um, thanks for your talk. Cancer actually seems very similar to psychiatric illness to me <laughs> due to hmm. the difficulty in discerning self, non-self. We could even consider our own version of a two-hit hypothesis in which underlying dimensional factors. Well, this goes on quite a long way. <laughs> uh, gosh, we may not have time to go through it. Uh, let me see. Uh, how much of how much of factors like ACEs, substance use, living situation, intellectual ability will be included in your EMR review in order to understand how they may interact with mutations? Well, that's tough. Um, I mean, it gets to the point where we know that psychiatric illnesses are really complicated and one has to try and keep things clean initially, knowing that all these other factors are involved. In terms of uh, data mining, sure, the nice thing about data mining is there's lots of information there. The not so nice thing is that the data isn't always very clean, but we might well be able to yield, uh, generate some information, um, but we won't have information, say, on genetic mutations on large number of people yet. That's a future kind of thing. All right, we do have time for this one last question. Amber Davis, which is sort of related to one really question. Has there been consideration for subtypes of schizophrenia based on trauma history? Um, I would group that together in the environmental category, which I find actually genetics is hard, but environmental impact on schizophrenia and other major mental illnesses is even harder to understand. And I think once there's some clarity at a genetic level and in terms of other types of um, subgrouping based on phenotypes, then it becomes easier to pick out what is uh, relevant on an individual basis, like individual life experiences, such as trauma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you, Russ. Wow, the center, you and the center uh, doing great work, and it's a wonderful team of people that you put together. Uh, look forward to seeing how it progresses. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good week.